Take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to 2 Peter, um, chapter 3, 1 Peter, excuse me, 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 15. As you're turning there, we're in a series, Do You Believe What You Believe You Believe? Do you believe what you believe you believe? Uh, we've been exploring what we believe. We've been exploring what we believe. We've explored what we believe about God. This week we're going to st- study or look at and explore what we believe about the Bible. The Bible. The Bible, isn't it filled with contradictions and inconsistencies? I mean, the Bible. I mean, isn't it written in such a way that, that really it's not even close to what was originally written, what we have today? I mean, the Bible, isn't it just a collection of myth and fable written, compiled long after the events took place and changed and modified and embellished? I mean, the Bible, I mean, there's really no evidence that anything in it can really be trusted, right? Isn't it just blind faith to believe anything written in it? I think we've probably all heard, or maybe you're here today and you hold those objections, objections like that. And, and as, you, as you think about those, those objections, those, those, those things we might believe or we've heard of those objections, they are things that, that are hurdles to our faith, hurdles to putting our faith in what God's Word says, fuel doubts that people have about Christianity, about faith in Christ, doubts, doubts about God's Word. What we believe about God's Word is critical. Uh, The foundation of our faith is rooted in what Scripture teaches us about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is central to our faith. And the Bible teaches us something about the resurrection of Jesus. Can we trust? It matters that we can trust what it says. Actually, if you look back, doubts about God's Word and what God said, that's the original doubt. It's the original doubt that the serpent that Satan whispered into Eve when in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent said to Eve, did God actually say? It's the first temptation, the original doubt. Doubting God's word is a tool that the enemy uses to destroy our faith, that, that hamstrings our faith, that keeps us from having any faith at all. And so this week, we're going to dive into this extremely important subject. And, and it's so important. I, I was, this week, I was talking to Crystal, and I said, you know, I sh- shared some things about five years ago, four or five years ago. Do uh, you, you think people will remember some of that? And can I share some of those things from four or five years ago? And she just kind of laughed. Like, you really think people remembered anything you said like four or five years ago? Uh, so just know that uh, I'm going to share some things that I shared. I, I, I could count on one hand, I think, probably the times I've done that since in the 17 years I've been here. But the, some of the things are so critical to what we believe about Scripture that they bear repeating. And there's a story, too, that I want to share with you that really helps to illustrate what we're talking about today. I, as last week, I want to give you some resources to, that can help you go deeper if you want to go deeper. And uh, one that I shared last week, Norman, Norman Geiser, Geisler wrote a book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Great book. I encourage you to read that. Also, uh, J. Warner Wallace wrote Cold Case Christianity. It's also a podcast, two great resources. And then, of course, Lee Strobel wrote The Case for Faith, The Case for Christ. Uh, the Case for Christ in particular will uh, we'll, uh, talk about some of the things that we will talk about today. Let me remind you of the scripture that is really the foundational kind of reason why we want to talk about some of the things in this series. Do you believe what you believe you believe? Found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. And so my prayer as we explore God's Word is if you are here today and you know someone that has some doubts about Scripture, that you can be encouraged today, that you can be given some handles today so that you can share the hope that you have found that rests on the solid foundation of God's Word. Or maybe secondly, you're here today and you're really struggling with what is going on in your life. There's some things happening. And today, as you listen, to, as we talk about God's Word, you can just be reminded that you can trust God's Word, God's love letter to you. So when you read its words and you hear what it has to say, that it is God's message message his word to you to encourage you through whatever difficulty you're going through. You can trust this word. 
Or maybe you're here today and God's been working in your life. And one of the things that you have struggled to cross that line of faith and put your faith fully in Jesus Christ as your Savior because you've had, had doubts about God's Word. Can I actually really trust God's Word? And so today my prayer is by the Spirit of God that that doubt will be removed. And today that you can make it that decision as the Spirit moves in you to cross that line of faith and put your faith in Jesus Christ. The year was 1932. It was in the midst of the Great Depression that was impacting all areas of American life, including the great American pastime of professional baseball. It was even baseball in need of a boost during that time in our nation's history. There was a sports editor, Arch Ward, who worked for the Chicago Tribune, and he wrote a, an article where he talked about the perfect team. He wrote this article where he, he just kind of just kind of was thinking, what, what would it look like to have the perfect team from the American League and the perfect team from the National League? Who would be on those teams? And so as a result of Arch Ward's column in the Chicago Tribune, a firestorm of discussion across the nation ensued. Knowing that the mayor of Chicago was trying to do something special in connection with the World's Fair that was happening in Chicago in 1933, an idea was born. What if we played a game where the best of the American League and the best of the National League came together in what was going to be the first all-star game? And what if they played one another? And so that game was planned for 1933. Voting took place across the nation as the, as the, as the nation voted on who the best players, again, in the National League and the American League were, and they were going to play together. And so the American League, at first base, it was Lou Gehrig. It was Lefty Gomez was on the mound, and one man was invited, not because he was the, the best necessarily in 1933. His career really was in its twilight he had, for the past 20 years, dominated the sport of baseball at right field for the Yankees. None other than Babe Ruth, the Sultan of Swat, the great Bambino, and he was chosen to play right field. He was out of shape, past his prime, but his name recognition helped draw the sellout crowd to Comiskey Park in Chicago. And so the idea of the first All-Star game was born. It was 1933. At the same time, Chris and I had met a pastor on California several years ago, and his grandmother worked at J.C. Penney in behind the counter in Chicago, and she was courting. Everybody know what courting is? She was courting a man that worked in lived in Gary, Indiana, and he loved baseball, and so she decided to get him them tickets to this all-star baseball game. Now, she couldn't afford the tickets behind home plate. She could only afford the dollar and 10 cent tickets, right field, lower deck. And so they went to that first all-star game in 1933. Babe Ruth would come up in the second inning. He would strike out. He would miss the ball so badly that he almost fell down, had to right himself by, by falling onto his pad, hanging onto his bat. He came back up in the third inning. By this time, Hallahan was pitching. And the jury is still out whether he served one up to the babe or whether he was trying really to get a fastball past him. But Babe Ruth connects with the ball and it rockets its way to right field. 48,000 people jump to their feet. This pastor's grandparents leap to their feet. His grandfather, the ball as it comes towards them, grazes his fingertips, falls to the ground. The scrum ensues, and as a result, he comes up with that baseball. Now that night, they tried to go down and get Babe Ruth's signature. They weren't able to. But they decide that they're going to go back two weeks later and they get tickets behind the visiting, the Yankees were going to be in Chicago. And so they get tickets behind the visiting, uh, the visiting players bench. And they are able to, two weeks later, to get Babe Ruth's signature on the ball. Here's a picture of that baseball. The first home run in an all-star game hit by Babe Ruth in 1933 at Comiskey Park. Now, his grandparents had passed and his parents had fallen on hard times. And so 
they decide as a family that maybe they should sell this ball. And so uh, this pastor that I met, he, he decides he's going to call around to see some collectors and to see, as he tells them the story, what, what, what he might be able to get for the ball. And so as he tells them about this ball, they want to know the story of how he acquires the ball. And he tells them the story and, and they ask, well, do you have any evidence? And his reply is, well, uh, no, I mean, this is my family's story. So, well, there's other stories. There's actually a story of, of a man who paid a dollar to a kid to go uh, to, the, to the person who caught the ball, and he bought it from that person for a dollar, and that family claims to have the ball today. There's also another story that Babe Ruth gave the ball to a mayor of a city that he would visit later, and supposedly that's the ball. Do you have any evidence that what you have is the actual ball. So, well, well, no, but again, this is my family. I've listened to my grandparents growing up tell this story over and over. This is my grandparents. I trust my grandparents. They, th- this is the ball. The collectors, well, kid, you've got a good story, but without any proof, without any evidence, it's just a good story. So, the baseball is probably worth eight to ten thousand dollars. A Babe Ruth signed baseball of that era, maybe eight to ten thousand dollars. There's a lot of people with good stories. That's about all it's worth. So hold that thought. We'll come back to it. So do we have anything when we think about God's word besides just a good story? Is it just a story of God's love for us? Is it just a document that? that supposedly points us to himself, that, that is this document that, that is a path in its pages of how we can connect with him through the person of Jesus Christ, is all we have just a good story? Do we have answers to these doubts that so many people that we know, we've heard, we've experienced, or maybe we even hold as we sit here today? Do we have anything to say, or is it just a good story? So glad you asked. Now, if you were going to go into a court of law and you were defending yourself, you would have the right to be able to speak. And so what is the Bible? As we think about some of the evidences of what maybe the Bible would say about itself, what's the testimony from the Bible? What does Scripture say about itself? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, Paul's writing to young Timothy. Timothy, he says this, But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you've learned and have, and have firmly believed knowing from whom you've learned it and how from a childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. He says, Paul does, to Timothy, continue in what you've learned what you've learned from Scripture, what's been passed down from you in these sacred writings. Writings that Paul, when he describes it, have the power, he says, to to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. And then he, he, he says in that next verse something that it's like Paul was like coining a phrase that we don't find in other ancient, in ancient literature. It's that phrase that's been translated that all Scripture is breathed out by God, that it is the breath of God, the very breath of God. And so we think about what does Scripture have to say about itself? What's the foundation of biblical liability, the authority of Scripture? We see one of the things, one of the evidences is its internal evidence. What Scripture says about itself is that it is the Word of God. It is the breath. It is the breath of God. 394 times the Old Testament refers to Scripture as the Word of God. And then what about Jesus? How did Jesus view Scripture? There's several places where Jesus talks about Scripture, but let me just uh, grab a few. Luke 24, verse 44, and then he, Jesus says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, so he's talking about the Old Testament, must be fulfilled. So Jesus, when he's talking about these major sections of Scripture, he says all of what it says must be fulfilled. The Bible has authority. Its words are true. Its words will come to pass just as it says. He says 
basically that same idea in Matthew 5, 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Again, everything that you see written in Scripture will come to pass. These are the supernatural words of God. So, there's internal evidence. It's the way Scripture frames itself. It's the way Jesus frames Scripture, how Jesus views Scripture. I said this a few weeks ago when we talked about how Jesus viewed the story of Jonah. And I'm on team Jesus. So, if Jesus looked at Scripture as authoritative and Jesus looked at Scripture as reliable, if Jesus looked at the Old Testament, the, way, the light that he looked at it in, that's the light that I want to look at it in. I don't want to have a dimmer view of Scripture than Jesus. I want to have the same view he has. How did Jesus frame it? It's part of that internal evidence where we understand biblical reliability, that it's more than just a good story. But this internal evidence, what the Bible says it's about itself, what Jesus says about Scripture, we have to recognize that that is a circular argument, so there's got to be more to it than that. What the Bible says about itself also, we see the internal evidence, and we could talk about prophecy. Prophecy is, uh, and there's different types of prophecy, but part of prophecy is when, when Scripture says something that will take place will actually happen in the future. So, before it happens, Scripture says it's going to happen. And then we see prophecy fulfilled when it actually comes to pass, and we see that in Scripture. Listen to the passage that the prophet Micah wrote 700 years before the time of Christ where he prophesied the exact town where Jesus, the Messiah, would be born. Micah 5, 2, But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Or the fulfilled prophecy that we see from the prophet Isaiah, written some 800 plus years before the time of Christ, where the prophet Isaiah, across the chapters of the prophecies of Isaiah, he foretold that uh, Jesus would be born of a virgin, that he would come from the house of David, that he would be spit on, that he would be struck, that he would be disfigured by suffering, that he would be rejected, that he would bear our sins and sorrows, that he would make atonement for the people with his sin, that he would die with transgressors, thieves, remember the cross, he had thieves on each side of him, he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. It's kind of hard to determine who, where you're going to be buried. Anyway, on and on and on, written hundreds of years before. The Dead Sea Scrolls, in 1947, a young shepherd boy came upon some caves, and in those caves he found some fragments, old tattered fragments, that he went into town and he sold some pieces, and then people realized, wow, these are authentic. Where did you get these? And so in the area of Qumran, in, along the shores of the Dead Sea, they found caves that housed scrolls that were thousands of years old, uh, some dated some 200 years before the time of Christ. The book of Isaiah, they found in its entirety. So those prophecies that were written 800 years before the time of Christ, there is a, there's a scroll of the entire book of Isaiah. It's 24 foot long. And that entire scroll that has all of those prophecies is written and it's been dated to 200 years before the time of Christ. So someone might say, well, those prophecies were written after the time of Jesus and then they, they looked at Jesus' life and then they, they wrote these things. The Bible's not that old until you actually look at the evidence and you see that it is that old. Some of us have been to Israel and you've been to Qumran and you've seen the caves. You've seen it hundreds of years before the time of Christ, and Jesus fulfills these prophecies perfectly. There's also a scroll that contains the prophet Micah and what he had to say about where Jesus would be born. Every Old Testament book was found in those caves that was written hundreds of years before the time of Christ, except Esther. That was the one book that was not found in the caves. And we have scores of other prophecies in the Old Testament fulfilled in Christ. Conservatively, there are 300 plus prophecies all fulfilled by Jesus, all pointing to Jesus supernaturally that God's word is true. It's prophecies fulfilled. Great place for an amen. amen. <laughs> Another thing that we could talk about is the historical accuracy of Scripture. Of what is the archaeological evidence 
What, how does that point to the authenticity, the reliability of Scripture? This, this Scripture that we have written over 1,500 years, 66 different books that are compiled in the Bible, 40 different authors written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, over three continents, Europe and Asia and Africa, all coming together into one seamless story of God's love, his plan of redemption, this great meta-narrative of God's, God's love for us. And so in Scripture, it's not just generic. We see, we see names of cities and rulers and historic events and dates and names of kingdoms and battles detail that if it were a work of fiction, you could see any number of errors and inconsistencies and things were just flat out wrong. But as it happens, that is absolutely not the case. What we see is evidence after evidence that points to the to the reliability of Scripture. And so we have this archaeological evidence. And I have to be careful because I could really geek out. We could be here this time tomorrow, but I promise I'm going to let you be able to get out for lunch on time. One of, the, one of the things that we could talk about is how people used to say, well, there's no record of David in the Old Testament. That, that David character in the Old Testament, there's actually no record of him in the archaeological evidence or archaeological record. There's nothing it talks about David. He's, he's made up. He's a made-up figure until the 1990s in what is called the Tell Dan inscription written in, ni- in the 9th century B.C. that talks about a battle where they overcame the house of David. And since that time, there have been three other uh, archaeological finds that again point that David was an actual historical character. We find it in the archaeological record. Or what about the skeptics that said, oh, well, there's th- such thing as Sodom and Gomorrah. That's, there's, that's just a fable. That's a myth. That didn't actually happen until a city was discovered in the area where it should be discovered, as Scripture talks about it, dating back to that time frame where mud b- brick structures were totally suddenly destroyed, only burned out Stone foundations are left, bricks showing sign of inc- signs of incineration, clay pot shards that have been melted into glass. Zircon, go look it up what that is. Crystals that were formed within a second because they were superheated so quickly. Ash and debris, a meter plus thick. Can you think of a story in Scripture that, that all of that would fit? Just like Scripture says. Or about the city of Jericho where they sit, used to say, well, that's really not a thing. That's, that's again, one of those made-up things. The story, if you remember the story of the walls of Jericho that fell during the conquest of the promised land. And for years they said there was no evidence until there was. Some of us, again, went and we went to Jericho. We saw the archaeological dig. We saw that what has been found fits to what Scripture says, what Scripture describes. Or the Hittite people that supposedly weren't a people until evidence found, was found that, yes, they actually were a people. Or Pontius Pilate, well, he didn't, wasn't really the governor during that time who tried Jesus until, again, evidence is found that actually he was. And on and on it goes. Doubts that have been proved, disproven over and over and over again, showing the reliability of Scripture the archaeological record. W.F. Albright of John Hopkins University said this, there's no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historicity of Old Testament tradition. Or Schofield in his book, Biblical Archaeology in Focus, said this, it's important to realize the archaeological excavations have produced ample evidence to prove unequivocally that the Bible is not a pious forgery. Thus far, no historical statement in the Bible has proven false on the basis of evidence retrieved through archaeological research. There's one final piece of evidence. We could go on and on, but I know we don't have the time to. And it's what we could call, again, a foundation for the reliability of Scripture, the authority of Scripture, the manuscript evidence. When you look at any piece of ancient, any ancient manuscript, scientists, scholars affirm the authenticity of those ancient documents, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a process that they use, the manuscript evidence. Because we don't have the originals, how can we know that what was, orig- what was originally said, that what we have today is, is, is a good record of what was originally said? To be able to say yes to that. So manuscript evidence answers the question, how reliable are the copies that we have currently? How many manuscripts have survived that we have currently? How consistent are those manuscripts? So if, you, if a, a, a work was written and then the gap between what was written and the first manuscripts you have, the longer that gap, 
then there's more uncertainty. But when the gap is short or, or when there's multiple copies of, of, the, of, of it and when you compare them all and they all line up, even though they come from all over the place, again, that's all evidence. So it's the gap between the original that was written and the existing copies that we have today. All of that matters. And based on that evidence, we can say with reliability that what we have is true. And so whether it's Plato and his works that the scholars don't, don't question or whether it's Caesar's Gallic Wars or Homer's The Iliad. Some of you actually, have, you know, you've studied that in school at times. No one doubts those works, those ancient works. Here's a chart that I know that's going to be difficult for you to read. And in this chart, uh, you can see on the left is the author. In the middle, the next row is the book. And then the date that it was written. And then the earliest copies that we have. And then the next one is the gap. You do the math of when it was written and the earliest copies you have. And then the numbers of those copies that you can compare against one another. And so, in general, uh, the, the gaps are around a thousand years between when, when these ancient works were first written and the first copies that we have. The Homer's, the Iliad uh, is, is a little bit of an exception to that. It's about 500 years, four or 500 years is the gap. And then the numbers of copies matter as well. Uh, so we've got 600 plus copies of Homer's, the Iliad. Uh, and then you look at the New Testament and there is no comparison at all between these other ancient documents other ancient writings that are without question by scholars and scripture. So you have the New Testament, parts of it written as early as 50 uh, AD up to about 100 AD. And you've got the first fragments at about 114. Um, you have those fragments that are within uh, a few decades of one another. And then you have books uh, that were found within 100 years, 200 or 150 years, uh, most of the New Testament, and then the complete New Testament within uh, 225 years. And the number of copies is 53, I know you can't read those numbers, 5,300 plus copies when this was written, and there's more being found and discovered through archaeological digs. Suffice it to say that what we have, when we think about the writings of 1 Corinthians, which were some of the earliest writings, or the book of Mark, we have, we have fragments that were just very, very close to when it was actually written. In fact, when Paul talks about that there are hundreds of witnesses that can attest to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, those witnesses were still alive when he wrote it. And we have no record that they were refuting the fact of the resurrection because you could go talk to them. And I wish we had time to talk about how scribes were so meticulous in the way they copied Scripture. When we went to Qumran, this community where these, where these Dead Sea Scrolls were, were, were found, there were these big baths, these mikvahs that, that people that were scribes, it was a, it was a colony of scribes, and they would, they would, when they came to the Word of God as they're copying, uh, copying Scripture, as they came to the Word of God, they would stop, they would put their pen down, they would go and they'd have to take a bath, and then they would go back to cleanse themselves before they even wrote the name of God. And then they would use a special pen when they wrote the name. And then there were people that, 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 that went back behind them and made sure that, that what they copied was exactly comparing it to the original. And friends, in short, what we have in our hands today is the faithful, reliable transmission of God's word, the Bible, just as he intended us to have it. And as Paul said, it tells the story of how we can find faith in Jesus, how we can find eternal life in Christ, how we can find hope in Christ, what we have in our hands today. So is the Bible more than just a good story? Absolutely. As our worship team comes up, let me tell you the end of the story. Again, this pastor that Chris and I had, had met uh, several years ago, as I told you, they didn't have any evidence, but then after his grandparents had passed, they were looking through some of their documents, and they found, they came across a scrapbook that they'd never seen before. None of them, his parents, none of them had ever seen before. And when they opened it up, this scrapbook had a newspaper article from the Gary newspaper, Gary, Indiana newspaper, and the title was Hometown Boy Gets Ruth's Ball, written that year. It was the story of, with his grandfather's name in the story and his address. <laughs> where they could go back and check 
and how he ends up, the story of how he ends up with a bowl. There were ticket stubs from the game that they found in the scrapbook, and there was a document that was notarized that has the story, and I have pictures of those documents. These are the documents that they found. And so they excitedly called back. They called Cooperstown, where the all-star, uh, or the, oh, I'm sorry, where the or, uh, Hall of Fame is. And he called some auction houses and some other collectors. And he said, here's what I've got. And he sent pictures of, of the documents. They got calls back immediately. It, you didn't tell us you had this evidence. This changes everything. So no longer, oh, it's a good story, kid, but there's lots of good stories. No, this is different because you have evidence. And so they put it up for auction at an all-star game several years ago. This is what the auction house put in the publication that they put out about this ball. There are three pieces of paper that go with this ball. Ticket stubs, newspaper clippings, and a signed affidavit notarizing the account of the story. And then they said this. Simple, incredible rarity, which is without question the most documented vintage home run baseball of significance ever to be seen, held, or offered at public auction. Worth eight to ten thousand dollars as a Ruth signed baseball from the era with a good story, but none of the evidence. And now, with the evidence, the bidding started at the auction of fifty thousand dollars. There were 13 people in the room, other people on the phone, people bidding. It ended up selling for eight hundred and five thousand dollars. And when we think of God's word, do we have doubts on its own? It's just a story. But there's solid, reasonable evidence that support the reliability that its truth is priceless. It's able to point us to eternal life. It's able to point us to salvation in Jesus. Evidence that is so much more than just a good story. It's a reliable foundation of our faith that should not be the uncertain foundation of our doubts. It is the story, as Paul said, that makes us wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus. So, are you here today, believers, and you know somebody that's doubting Scripture? I hope that I've given you just a little bit to help you to be ready to share the hope that you've found in Christ based on God's Word. Maybe you're here today, and again, you're struggling, and there's stuff going on, and you're struggling so bad that a lot of probably what I've said today has been blah, 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 blah. Hear this. God's word is true. It's his love letter to you. And I don't know what you're going through, but he loves you. He cares for you. His word to you is true. And when he says he will never leave you, never forsake you, when he says he'll walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death, whatever he says in his word is true and will come to pass. He is coming again. So I don't know what you're going through, but be encouraged today. And then finally, if you are here and you've had objections to faith, you've struggled with doubts and you've struggled to overcome, is God real? Is scripture true? Can I really believe it? Can and I put my life on, on the line and, and give my life to this, I would say to you, absolutely. So let the Spirit of God remove the stone of doubt out of your way today, of, of doubt around God's Word, and believe that this is His Word, His truth for you. The path of salvation comes through the person of Jesus Christ. He loves you. And as I pray for you today, I would invite you to invite Him to be your Savior. Father, as we conclude today, God, I pray that you, would, that you would just encourage us as we think about your word, the miraculous truth of your word, God. It is so amazing, unlike any other document. And God, you have supernaturally kept it for us. And it is what you intended for us to have, to know how to connect with you. Thank you for it. I pray you encouragement for those who are struggling. I pray, Father, for that person today that is making a decision right now to put their faith in you, to invite you to be their Savior, to confess their sin, and then to just invite Jesus, your Son, to be their Savior, to put their faith in you. God, I thank you for saving them. I thank you for what you're doing in lives and hearts and minds right now. Thank you, we pray in Jesus' name.